Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double Elab. I have nearly completed all of the repairs on my Drake TR3, so let's check out the progress. All right, let's get into it. I'm mostly done with the repairs to the TR3 and the one thing I haven't finished yet is I've opened up a can of worms, as you can see here for the, for the transmit receive relay. Uh, I will come back to that later in this episode. I want to cover kind of the easier stuff right now, beginning with the large electrolytic can capacitor. Now, I left it in place. You can see it kind of barely uh, poking through the wires right here. Um, I disconnected it electrically, so it's isolated. So you can still see it on the top of the chassis, and it looks like it's original. But I've replaced it with this little terminal strip here with two of the three caps that were in it. And the terminal strip is elevated off the chassis slightly so that I get maximum clearance to all the components around it. C145A, the first of the three capacitor values that were inside this can, has been replaced by this guy right here. So originally it was 20 microfarad. I've replaced it with 22 microfarad rated at 350 volts. So this guy along with R110, which is 2.5K, comprise a 150 volt DC bus that looks like it's primarily used as screen grid bias voltage on many of the tubes. Now, I don't know why Drake also has um, a 150 volt DC regulated bus created by OA2. Now I can understand why they'd want regulated voltage for some of the circuits for tighter control over variation, but why that uh, OA2 didn't supply everything, eh, I'm not quite sure, but there's two 150 volt DC buses in the rig. C145B, that's replaced by this guy here because he's larger. The original value was 60 microfarad and along with R111, which is 1.3K, that generated a 245 volt DC bus, according to the schematic, which is slightly lower, only 5 volts lower than the 250 volt main bus that's in there. So that's kind of a head scratcher. It only uh, feeds to V16 and V18. Those are, uh, do the duty of the 9 megahertz oscillator and the product detector and the microphone amplifier. So for some reason, they've got slightly lower voltage in their own, I guess, better regulated circuit maybe with the use of a, a separate resistor and capacitor. But nonetheless, that's the purpose of this guy right here. And then the third one is just C145. I don't know why it's not C145C, but nonetheless, it's a 10 mic um, electrolytic. It's applied to V19A for the Vox circuit. It's a bypass network on the cathode. And because that's so small, I just installed the cap you see right here, the replacement of 10 mic at uh, 50 volts, I think it is, directly on the tube pins. There's no reason to have to put it over here remote. These newer ones are so much smaller, you can put it right on the tube. So that's what I did. And there are two other electrolytics in the rig, also at 10 mic, and I ended up uh, replacing them. Here they are, after taking them out. I replaced them with 10 microfarad at 50 volts, and you can see one of them here. Again, it's just attached right to the tube socket pins, and the second one you can't really see, it's on this little board right here. So that takes care of all the electrolytics. Let's talk about film capacitors. There are five total in the rig. There are four that are rated at 0.47 microfarad and one at 0.1. And here they are after I've taken them out, and it's pretty easy to see the replacements. They're a bright yellow color, and they are all on boards. None of them are attached directly to tube sockets or anything like that. And as I mentioned uh, before in this series, I take these boards out and getting them out can be a bit of a challenge, but it's certainly easier to work on these outside of the rig. You get much better access to the solder joints and it lets me do a better inspection uh, of, the, of the quality of the resistors that are on there and replace some that might be needed. And then of course put the board back in when I'm done. And speaking of resistors, I've replaced about a dozen of them in here, including the broken one over here. That was the R40 that showed up in the prior video, along with any of the others that checked more than 10% out of tolerance. So we're all good there. Now, a perfectly valid question at this point would be, did I really need to go through all the effort to replace these film and electrolytic capacitors? And there's a couple ways to answer that question. The easiest and simplest answer is, of course, they're old. We know that film capacitors and we know that electrolytic capacitors are going to degrade over time. 
and this rig is decades old and it's just a matter of time before these things start leaking and turn into uh, resistors internally. So it's just good practice to do that. And that's generally been my philosophy. I approach any rig that's this old kind of the same way, but there is a way to quantify this. And I think I've shown this a couple times in my channel and I'm always tempted when I do a repair like this to check out uh, these old caps and try to quantify, well, are they bad or not? And fortunately, Paul Carlson over on Mr. Carlson's lab a few years ago on his Patreon channel, published a really nifty circuit design for a low voltage capacitor leakage tester. And this is my uh, version of it, let's say. And I'll use version lightly because this is one of the very first electronics projects that I built probably four or five years ago, maybe. And definitely pre-COVID because that's how we all uh, kind of oh, get up in age. You start thinking about now, did that happen before COVID or after COVID? This was definitely before COVID. Um, it works. It looks very ugly. It's just a piece of perf board and, you know, a bunch of globby solder on the back to make the connections, but I've used it many times and I've used it here to check out these caps. So let's have a quick look. It needs 27 volts DC. So let me hook it up. And yep, there is no reverse polarity. Well, actually, I think I did put a diode on here for reverse polarity protection. I'm not sure, but uh, get the colors right, I'll be okay. So it's on discharge. And what'll happen is, and what'll happen is if I take some new caps here as I guess the gold standard, kind of show how this works. Got it on electrolytic mode. This little rotary switch is for three different voltages. I got it set for 12 volts. Since this is a 16 volt cap, find the ground side here, find the positive side here. And what I'll do when I flip this switch to test, we'll see some lights light up here. The red light will come on, the green light will go out. The bar graph will go all the way to the right and then you'll see it decay. And then when it decays all the way down and the green light comes back on, then that would be the end of the test. So the unit that this is quantifying the capacitor leakage in is in time. So just as a quick example, we'll look at this electrolytic here. It only takes about four seconds or so for it to run down. So what I've done over the years, I've taken some brand new capacitors, like even these new films that I put in, and I've made up my own little collection of what looked like to be, you know, the quote gold standard that I'd use to judge the old caps by, and then test the old caps and see how they do. And so that's what I've done here. And my handwriting is not very uh, clear if you are struggling to make this out. I apologize, just uh, the way I write. But uh, nevertheless, what I found with the, um, there's a point one, this guy right here, and there's four point four sevens in the film family, and then in these two electrolytics, yeah, they all test about the same with the exception of one part. They all test about the same as brand new. There was one of the electrolytics that had a much slower uh, recorded time than the new part. And even the uh, the other uh, one was a bit uh, slow to almost you know, a little more than double. The films, they all tested fine. So what does it mean? I guess you could interpret this to say that even though the, these are old, the exception of these two electrolytics, probably could have just left those films in a little while longer. But I'd always say the deciding factor is when is someone going to get in this radio again in the future and deal with this problem? They're either going to deal with it like I did uh, when they happen to pick it up at a ham fest down the road and just decide to go through it. Or worst case, which is not a good case, they're going to fail. And you might take something else out in the circuit. A lot of these film capacitors, when they short out or get to be high resistance, might start to load down a tube section and you might burn out a tube. So is it really worth it to delay replacing a part that only costs a dollar or two to potentially destroy a tube that costs a whole lot more? I don't think so. So I go through and I just replace them all. Next, what I did is part of good practice is go around and loosen and retighten all of the grounding screws that are on the tube sockets or any of the other boards that I didn't remove or any of the terminal strips. It's just good practice on a rig this old just to crack those loose and retighten them just in case there's a little oxidation in there that might affect uh, the resistance from that particular part to the ground and certainly helps reduce the risk if there's any uh, intermodulation that might happen at a corroded joint or a partially uh, tightened joint. So that only took a few minutes to go through, so that's all done now.
And one other task that I completed and actually got lucky on is I did remove the carrier balance pot and checked it out more closely. And I'm glad I did because as it turns out, it doesn't look like it's defective. So I might have caught a break there. All I had to do was clean it and, and run it through a few dozen rotary cycles and it seems to be working smoothly and working fine. And that's good because as I mentioned in the prior episode, when those go bad, they're not replaceable. And the one that I had in my prior TR3 had definitely gone bad. The carbon trace that was on the phenolic or Bakelite substrate just separated. So the pot was just completely shot and was beyond salvage or beyond repair. So I think I caught a break. Fingers crossed that this guy is going to work okay still. And now for the transmit receive relay. As I mentioned earlier, I did go down a rabbit's hole here. Ended up temporarily detaching the power connector so I can move it over and get down in here and desolder all the electrical connections that go to the feed-through capacitors that are on this little metal bracket that holds the relay and then the antenna connector. And I'm glad that I did go through all this work because what I found is when I, when I took this the board out and desoldered the relay socket that was on there and I'll show a close-up here of what I found. It's a single-sided board and in order to get a solder connection to the feed-through capacitors they put some little metal eyelets, more than likely some brass eyelets with a tin plating on there and just kind of crimped them into the holes in the board. Now that's a single-sided board and as it turns out it's only that crimp connection that's making electrical uh, contact to the trace and those eyelets have started to become loose. It's actually um, not a solder joint that connects the eyelet to the trace and that's why that uh, relay coil circuit was intermittent. It was an actual defect in that circuit board. So if one of them or in this case two of them were starting to become loose and all of them were definitely suspect. Now I don't know why that board was made that way. Maybe back in the day that was before two-sided boards were around or maybe they weren't uh, uh, economical so they may have had no choice to what to put those eyelets in there but they are failing and that needs to be replaced in my opinion I think that design was doomed from the start because just with thermal expansion and contraction you got dissimilar metals there that inevitably that connection was going to become loose so not quite sure what the decision process was back in the day to do that but I can do better today by designing a replacement double-sided board with plated through holes and that's exactly what I've done. So I whipped up a design in KiCad. It was not very hard at all to reverse engineer the board and figure out the exact hole spacing for the relay. That relay is still available today and so is the socket so I had the footprint to use. So where I stand right now, I've ordered the board for this project. It's going to take two to three weeks to get it, and I'm just patiently waiting for them to show up in the mail from China, like a lot of us do nowadays, get our boards from overseas. I have salvaged the socket. It was pretty easy to desolder it, and um, you can buy these new, but I didn't see the reason to spend almost five bucks to get a new one because this one is still in perfectly good shape. So once I get that board in and get the socket solder to it that'll be hopefully the final repair step that I need to do on this rig. And I would also add that despite my best effort I did end up doing some physical damage to the feed-through capacitors on that metal bracket. Um, one of the things you have to be careful with on these Drake rigs is the wire insulation doesn't tolerate heat for very long. It starts to melt and pull away from the end of the wire so you have to be pretty, you have to be pretty quick with your soldering technique and I thought I was, but nonetheless, um, apparently the ceramic on those feed-through caps is just degraded now. It's pretty brittle, and they started to crumble. So got really concerned that I was going to have to replace a bunch of expensive and rare feed-through caps. But as it turns out, they're still checking fine for capacitance. I checked them on my uh, multimeter, and they're all about uh, right around uh, 1 nanofarad, which, according to the schematic is where they're supposed to be. So I think I may have uh, dodged a, you know, another big problem there and I should be able to just reuse them. I'm going to be optimistic that I'm only going to need one more episode in this series where I can get that relay board installed in the TR3 and get it working and get it aligned and not have any other issues pop up. I've also got to deal with the RV3, which I'm also going to be optimistic about because I've taken a quick look at the inside and it's in really good shape. I'm not thinking it's going to need much in the way of any repairs or anything like that other than just maybe a quick cleaning and it'll be good to go and I can get these both back on the air and start making contacts again. So as always, I thank you guys for watching my channel. I do hope you're enjoying this series on this Drake TR3. So until next time, bye for now.